what I love about garbage in Northern California, especially, is it seems like most of the guys that started these companies years ago all immigrated from Italy, you know, and came over here, and you know, which is what my grandfather did, came over on a boat, and you know, settled in New Jersey in the beginning, but um, finally made it out to the West Coast. And I remember my mom telling me on their way out here, he told her that you know, when you get to California. There's going to be gold on one side of the street and oranges on the other. But uh, he came out here and got in the garbage business like all, like all the Italians, it seems. So I'm real proud of the Italian heritage mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, they got into this business and we've all stayed. One of the reasons that my grandfather and my father, I think we have to look at both of them, why they left uh, Europe and they came from northern Italy. My grandfather left after World War I. There wasn't much opportunity in the uh, community that he lived. It was a small farm town. And he was looking for a better life for himself and his family. So he came over um, in what was typical of the Italian immigrants or immigrants to our country is that they got into um, a number of hard working jobs. So he worked on a farm. He worked his way across um, the United States on a railroad. Um, he uh, did a, a number of those type of activities and then got involved in the, in the garbage company here in Concord. My father, um, he left Italy and came to this country when he was a very young man. I think he was 12 or 13 years old. He went into the armed services um, and after World War II then he married my mother and got involved in this business. And again it was all for you know, the betterment of their families and themselves and the future generations. And that was very typical of what the uh, old timers did. My father's name was Giovanni. Very proud of him. He was uh, a literate person, never allowed to go to school in Italy. Came over here, somehow was able to cross the ocean, cross the country in a train, not speaking the language. Uh, went to work and uh, was able to provide uh, an education for me, and uh, and uh, we've never looked back. Uh, it's just a land of opportunity. The companies were formed back in the early 1900s on the grounds of survival. They merged together the resources by today's standards would be an issue of antitrust by fixed price fixing and gouging. But whether it's a matter of survival, they came in, they put their routes together, they bought hay together, and they assigned their specific routes. And when they went out, they put the money on the table, paid the bills, what was left over, they spilled equally amongst themselves. And that's how the conceptual idea of these scavenger corporations began. The Bocciagalupi family uh, got into the garbage business probably in the early 1900s. Archangelo, which was my grandfather, uh, started in uh, San Francisco and around 1900, we don't know exactly when, but uh, we know when it ended. He uh, uh, bought a, a cart there in, we think, around 1902, something in that area, and uh, paid $500 for it, which was uh, a lot of money those days. Uh, he uh, had a buyer that uh, came to him and was going to buy his cart, and uh, my grandfather was going, going to go back to Italy and retire and be rich. Uh, the only problem was with the money was coming at the end of the month, it was a handshake deal, and the earthquake came. My first grandfather came over in uh, 1878. And before, before he went in the garbage, he was a farmer in Colma, but then uh, when the fires, I guess they need some somebody to clean up. That's, I, I believe that's the way the garbage companies start, when they had to clean up San Francisco earthquake. And, and they start hauling, clean up the city and throw the debris, waste in a bay. And uh, this is going back to right after the fire. So then my grandfather, before sunset and and scavenger, protective union, if you heard that name before. So in, in, by 1910, 1911, 1915, they start get organized. And that's when my grandfather quit and uh, he went back to the old country. 
My wife's grandfather was actually one of the guys that started Scavengers Protective Association, which later became Golden Gate Disposal. Mm -hmm. So he, he was, uh, came from a town called Fontana Rosa and, uh, in Genoa and became uh, one of the first owners of, had his own, had his own routes. And then when they incorporated mm -hmm. in 1929, he was one of the partners that actually was paid to come into Scavengers Protective because he had a pretty nice route back mm -hmm. then. I was born in San Francisco. My father was a garbage man. And then my father decided, eh, let's go back to your country for a while. So he went over there. They, he, he put up a little card room, and, and, uh, and he was doing OK. And in the meantime, I grew up. I was two years old when I went over. And uh, I went to school there. And, uh, but then when Mussolini came into power, my father was a smart man. My father was illiterate, but smart. And he said, you know, Mussolini and Hitler, they're going to conquer the world, but you better get the hell out of here. Go back over there. You're American citizen. You can go. The other, my brother and my sister couldn't go, but I, I was born here. And she was helped. At the last boat, I come over the boat and couldn't even go back. But <laughs> I was here, and I started working. My uncle was here. I went, my cousin, I went to live with him. and. Uh, and I started, I wasn't even 16, 16 and a half. And I, I started in a company. I, I made $3 a day. Can you believe it, $3 a day? $18 a week <laughs> for six days. <laughs> but in those days, it was better than nothing, you know. My father was Cesar Aquilino. He was uh, one of the pioneers and he was one of the youngest. He came from Italy, with uh, northern Italy, and when you emigrated to the United States, they tell you go to San Francisco, Pete's the barber's son there or whatever, and he'll help you out. And they live communally, much the same as uh, the Mexican-Americans are doing, so they have four or five gentlemen together in, the, in a communal house, and then uh, if they were married later on, they sent for their families. And uh, he became uh, the youngest member of the board of directors of, uh, at that time, uh, Scavengers Protective. And they used to call him the avocado, which means lawyer. And uh, even though he had a, only a third grade education, uh, I think you can find many people in the industry who will agree that he was one of the pioneers, had a great deal of foresight. It couldn't be a nicer bunch of guys that, in the garbage industry. And it's, it's in Northern California, I only know of really, <clears throat> because we're, we just happen to be all of, almost all, except for Paul Matson and a few other guys, of Italian descent and from Northern Italy. You know, we're all from Genoa, around Milan, you know, those, those areas. And it's kind of indicative of, of the Italian immigrant during those days that when they got here, they were very industrious people the ones that stayed there were the artists and the artisans probably that stayed in Italy, but the ones that came over here because they were starving over there. And, and some of the things they can only do is, you know, in the gardening business or the garbage business or like today you can, you can parallel that with, with some of the minorities that come over here and that are gardeners and whatever, they can't do anything else. But we need those people. We need, they needed us then too, you know. But my father, uh, he came in 1919, and he was here for roughly five years, and he had a son. And then he went back to Italy. And then in 1940, he sent my brother over here, who is now with partners in Marine Sanitary Service. And then after the war, my brother was able to send for my father, and eventually my father sent for me in 1950. I knew before I came to America, there was going to be a garbage collector and there was going to work for, at that time, the company was called Scavengers Protective Association, that there was going to work for the company. The reason is, my father was here, I had two brothers in the company, I had my father's brother and my mother's nephew, my cousin. So my whole family was working for the Scavengers Protective Association. So when I got here, it was automatic that I would come and work for the company. My dad used to work for uh, the shipyards in South San Francisco. And they went on strike. Uh, they were on strike about eight months. So he was out of revenue. He was just getting picket money. So one of the garbage guys, uh, being Italian, everybody in the garbage business was Italian. He said, Gino, you want to come work in the garbage? Nah, I, said, I don't want to work in the garbage. So he finally went. 
and then he uh, stayed there for about six months. Shipyards went back to work and they offered him a share in the company. So he stayed with the garbage instead of going back to shipyards. My father had experience with a San Francisco company that had something like 180 something partners. And, uh, and during the war, they were in com competition uh, for workers and uh, with the shipyards paying higher wages and that. So they uh, would approach Italian, mostly northern Italian Genovesers, people from around Genoa area or in the northern California companies. And uh, they would uh, solicit them, a lot of them were farm workers and that, uh, or working on farms and uh, brought them into the company and told them that uh, they would come in and uh, they would have a salary and then they could pay for their an interest in the company out of their dividends, which was a pretty good deal. I'd buy the Golden Gate Bridge under those circumstances. San Francisco had a, and, oh, and Oakland, uh, those two I know of, San Francisco especially, uh, the garbage man was, the scavenger was called in San Francisco, and they were they were very they were highly regarded by the people, the, the people in San Francisco. They had had a lot of good feelings for them because in those days, we used to ring doorbells to collect the garbage bills, so we had a direct contact with them. So you're on a first name basis. I got involved in the business. I was born in '26, so it had to be 1938. My uncle was a partner in uh, Scavengers Protective at that time, which later on became uh, Golden Gate Disposal. And uh, I used to go over there after s school on Friday afternoon and uh, go collect all his bills for him on Greenwich and Green Street, Union Street. I used to collect all his bills for him, you know, knock at the door. Who is it? Garbage man. And I think in those days the rate was something like about 50 cents a month, give or take a little. When uh, I was about 14 or 15, I started working the garbage truck with him. We were 183 equal stockholders, and it was a corporation. In order to buy stock into the company, first of all, you can only buy 20 shares. You cannot buy 19 or 21, you have to buy 20 shares. And first you had to work on the trucks, and if the man liked you, if you were a good worker, then you would go in front of the board of directors of the company. Uh, if the board of directors accept you, then you have to go in front of the stockholders and they had to vote you in or not. In my situation, I had a little problem because I was too small and they really didn't want me in the company. The, the, the operation manager didn't want to hire me. But I had my father, my two brothers, and my <laughs> uncle, my cousin in the company, so I snuck in. So as soon as I was old enough to no nickel from a dime, I was out collecting my uncle's book. Mm -hmm. And I did that for 12 or 13 years. And uh, I graduated from high school. I went to work my uncle on the garbage truck and uh, started my career in the business. I bought a share in the business in 1956, I believe it was, from a Luigi Varney. I gave him $500 down and uh, I just assumed a note for uh, 2% interest, and I, my salary went up $200 a month with the first check of each month went to the bank. They took the $150 out plus the interest and the declining balance. And I was told by the president of the company, he said that I was buying a job. We had a few trucks, we had a few pieces of property, but you were buying a job for the rest of your life. And I thought that was a really a real good asset. Well, it's kind of manifest destiny. Uh my grandfather was a garbage man, my father, and uh, right out of high school, I just uh, stepped into the role, and uh, it's been good. I was born into the business in a sense that my dad and his brothers, in fact, his, his father too, my grandfather, were in the business uh, first in Oakland Scavenger Company. My grandfather and my father were both in the industry before me, so I'm third generation. And it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that I was going to be a garbage man. Um, back when I was in high school, I actually wanted to um, go into law enforcement. And my parents, once they got wind of that, pretty much would have nothing to do with it. And um, I graduated high school in June of 1981, and I came to work on July 9th of 1981. I got out of the service, and I came right in the company. And, um, I was very glad, very happy, very proud you know, to go back into my dad's company. I was born into it. <laughs>
Actually, um, it started with my grandfather, my dad, my uncle, you know, back in uh, 1962. My uncle, who was, you know, the president, you know, unfortunately died at 47 of cancer. And um, at that time, I was working at the landfill and, you know, he kind of brought me up here, you know, before he passed away and told me I need to take over, you know. So it was a, it was a scary time for me. I was pretty nervous. I was pretty confused. I wasn't even sure if I could spell refuse, but, um, you know, fortunately he, you know, lived for about a year after I came up here. So I spent a lot of time with him and a lot of time talking. There's six partners now and, you know, you know, myself, my brother, I've got a cousin who was, who was John's son and some on the Ratto side. And, you know, we've all got kids. You know, it's only one boy, there's a lot of girls. So <laughs> next generation is gonna be a lot of girls. But, um, you know, we're hoping that, you know, the fourth generation will, you know, take over and, you know, continue what was started, you know, by my grandfather. I think when your dad was no longer able to run the business and how proud he was of you boys taking over because he absolutely loved it. Loved his trucks. Just loved the idea that the boys were taking over. And when he passed away, I have an idea, it was probably one of the most difficult things for Alan, because he was very young, to know that now he had to take over with his brother's help, but he was going to be the president. So that had to be not easy. Myself and my brothers were third generation. And like I said, we have had uh, fourth generation in here, so we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Proud that my son's working for me and that he's going to take over one day. I have uh, two partners already. They took over from their dad. You know, I like to see him come in. And that way I can retire, take life a little easier. And I'm also proud that my daughter, uh, she runs the office, you know, and uh, that they like the industry. Also, we see uh, some of the, the young ones up there, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, we, in the, on a national level, we, we used to call them the SOBs, sons of bosses, but uh, <laughs> you have to be careful with that term. I am very proud that we've taken South San Francisco Scavenger Company from where it was when the last generation uh, turned over, basically, to this generation. We've taken it forward. I think probably that the fact that I'm a third generation and that we've been able to continue I mean, I think a lot of times in family businesses, you know, you see where the first generation does great, the second generation may do even better, but it seems like a lot of times the third generation, you know, kind of messes things up. We've looked at what my grandfather and my uncle and my mom and everybody had started, and we have pride in what they've done. And, you know, my motivation is, you know, to make them proud of the accomplishments I've been able to do and to continue to grow and to continue to make the company what it is today. I just always, you know, lo love the garbage industry. You know, my, my toys were garbage trucks, you, you know, the big ones and the little ones. I was born in 1955 and I had my diapers changed in a garbage truck on the front seat when I was just a baby. So I'd been around the garbage truck since then. Back then, they used to have uh, what they called an afternoon run when they had to go up and pick up the casinos. And when I was five years old, I started going out on the trucks in the afternoon runs. And then, of course, during uh, the summer and Christmas holidays, a lot of times I'd get up and go out at four or five in the morning and, you know, I'd ride on the truck and do what I could. And how many times I used to watch him, because the uh, Jack Pine Road, where he used, he used to come up the road, come up the hill to, with the little packer. Called, I called it the Little Packer. I was, what, five years, three, four years old. <laughs> He'd come up the hill, get almost, almost, almost to the top, and then the thing would just slide. Start spinning. And it's, the wheels are spinning to go right into the snowbank, be out there till, Sometime. what, midnight, one in the morning, two in the morning, trying to get the truck out. It was not easy. Yeah. Snow is not even easy now that we have all the equipment. I started as a little kid going with my dad riding and on the trucks and uh, at an early age and it was something that I always wanted to be was was a garment garbage man and also to play football so 
and it worked out where I'm back here at the company and I, I've been full time here since about, I want to say when I graduated from college in about 1983. I started off uh, early on when I was with my dad, I used to run with him, yeah, stay up with him and then put the lids back on the can and then we'd carry the, at that time they used to bundle all the newspapers and we used to, I used to carry them to the truck and stack them on the truck. Uh, then went to school and then between school and I was going to college it was a good way to stay in shape for football mm -hmm. so at that time we were carrying the cans on the back and uh, packing them and, and, and dumping that way a lot, a lot of hard labor you know so did that that would kept me in great shape one thing with us it was where it was a lot different then it was a lot easier for us as kids to go at uh, my dad on the truck mm -hmm. then you know now there's a lot of rules and laws where you can't can't have children on them so but when we were kids, you know, we were with him all the time. And if he was at factories, we were running around. And, you know, so we knew the business uh, from every step, you know, every every process that we had going on, operation that we going on. So See, in those uh, days, you could take your kids. You know, we would, children we didn't worry about. Let him ride So I, I would have him and his brother come with me. And I would take the can and I'd tell him, you take all the boxes and bring them in the truck. They, they were too too small to carry the, 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 anything, but in the meantime, if there was a box next to the can or on top of the can, that was their job to take it in the truck. Yeah. But then we bundled up and got ready for the long trip to the mm -hmm. landfill, which took 30 or 40 minutes. And I think it was five miles away, which now we do that in five minutes, yeah. you know. And that was considered a long trip to the landfill and back. That was, a, that was what was fun for us as children, mm -hmm. to ride on the trucks. The property was, had, my parents' house was one lot. The lot in the middle is where the trucks were kept and my grandparents were on the, the lot on the other side. Mm -hmm. I can remember on weekends we'd play on the trucks and, and do whatever, but that, that was kind of our playground when we were little was the open lot where the trucks were kept. I grew up in Woodland. Uh, on a, a dump, That's before we had sanitary landfills. Uh, we actually lived on the property, it was a 200 acre site owned by the city. Um, we used to run a, a herd of hogs on it that fed on the garbage and then when they were finished with it we'd uh, put a match to it and that would reduce the volume considerably and then we'd uh, get a D2 caterpillar, a small one, and, and that was part of my job. We'd push it up into a pile and and smash it down. So it, it went on for a long time. I'm, I'm thinking now that Dad, you must have thrown in a whole bunch of money into those dumpsters, but he would uh, let us crawl into the dumpsters behind the Northgate One, all of those stores mm -hmm. like the Hofbrau and the Safeway, and, and uh, we'd just go in there face first, going down for cash mm -hmm. and uh, coins and whatever we could as small children. And I. I too remember riding along on that truck. I think I was um, pretty small. I remember feeling pretty scared driving around in that open air truck. I've been in the business my whole life. I just uh, I grew up really on on a garbage truck and um, have uh, enjoyed being in the business all my life. Really, you know, I I uh, really started as on a truck as a kid. Um, really, a pretty young age, probably about 10, 11 years old. I started. Riding on the roll-off trucks and 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 doing that, riding on the truck. I actually, you know, as a child, you know, um, I really didn't know what a babysitter or a daycare was. It was really, my dad uh, showed up at, at uh, eight or nine o'clock in the morning and you know brought me the brought me down to the yard and I ended up crawling on a truck with one of the drivers and spent most of my time with the drivers and you know so you got to you got to learn a lot of things you know while you were having fun. Well, when I first started, I was 15 years old, and I only count the time that my dad started paying me, and that was <laughs> the summer of my uh, 15th birthday. I got involved, uh, my father was in the business before I was, and uh, when I was still in high school, he used to wake me up to help him go pick up garbage, so I took off from there, and I knew I wanted to be a garbage man since the time I was in about the sixth grade. I can remember at uh, five or six years old, you know, just being on the side of a truck. As a 12-year-old, I was um, sweeping the floors in the mechanics barn. At uh, 14 or 15 years old, I was baling paper. Um, 
And then at around 15 or 16, I was promoted to the garbage trucks. Greatest memory is when I was a teenager and I worked every summer. We would go down to work about three in the morning and adjacent to the dispatcher room was a sack room because we used burlap sacks in those days. And so if you didn't go to work at three, the next group of trucks went out at six. So the dispatcher at that time was my uncle, would send all the young kids into the sack room and we'd go to sleep. And it was the greatest sleep. It was just like sleeping on a cloud. It was perfect. My grandfather died when um, I was probably a year and a half old. He died in about 1965. So I don't have any memories of him as far as uh, the garbage industry goes. But I do have memories of going out with my father on the back of a rear loader when I was seven, eight, nine years old. And one memory in particular, I was riding on the back of an old leech rear loader and I was hanging onto the step because that was the greatest thing you know, an eight-year-old kid could do is ride on the step on the back of that garbage truck. And the handle was right above my head. And I was riding and when the packer blade finished its first cycle, that lever snaps down. And I just happened to be tall enough to where the lever snapped down and hit me on the top of the head like a hammer and pretty much knocked me off the truck. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid one time, I was riding with Izzy, this foreman that worked for us, and um, I was probably all of about eight years old at the time. Maybe, maybe I was even a little younger than that. And it was one of those hot afternoons that um, we were going back and forth to the landfill, making some making some trips out there. And uh, they used to have on the front of the trucks a, an old uh, burlap water bag. So when the truck overheated, you had some water to you know cool the truck down. And I remember we were coming, we came out of the landfill and you know my, I was sitting on the, they were cab over trucks, they were called white Mustangs. And I was sitting on the seat and uh, I was always bouncing around in the middle of the truck and in, in the truck and you know Izzy in this gruff old way just said you know sit down god damn it you know I mean it's you know you're ticking me off you know and so I'm sitting there and the seat was really warm you know it just you know it was really hot that day and I couldn't sit on that seat it was so hot and, and the more I moved around the more mad Izzy got and finally, you know, we, we came up to a stop sign and I said, you know what, there's something wrong here, you know, I mean, I was just a little guy and I said, you know what, I can't sit on the seat, it's too hot. And pretty soon smoke started coming out from above, underneath the truck <laughs> and the engine was on fire. <laughs> and so we pulled over and jumped out of the truck and, and grabbed that water bag and we got the we got the we got the fire out in the truck, but you know that was one of those one of those times. And we got back in the truck and we laughed like hell. But you know that we had to get the mechanic out there to fix the truck. And you know from then on, Izzy started to listen to me a little bit more. So when I was a little boy, you know, I was, I'd be on the trucks or I'd be on the bulldozer and I'd be on the dump. You know, sometimes collect the money for people bringing back trash brush because we had a um, place where we used to burn all the trash all the brush and uh, debris and uh, the one that sticks in my mind the most I think I was 11 years old I was operating the bulldozer and my dad was with me and I um, there was a garbage truck it was coming towards me and I thought he was gonna stop and I guess he thought I was gonna stop and Needless to say, neither of us stopped. <laughs> so we, <laughs> I plowed right into him. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, the early memories are coming to work with him when I was a little kid. And in those days, or right at the time we were becoming radio dispatched, rather than being able to call out to the routes, they'd compile a list of misses. And I can remember as a kid riding around with him in a, in a little dump truck we had and picking up all the misses all over the city that the drivers had accidentally left. And I can recall I started working when I was 16 years old, I think, on the garbage trucks, even earlier, maybe I shouldn't say that. But I mean, and uh, it was fun because I had money, you know, I was working all the time. And then I go to high school, you know, and then college in the afternoon, when it was junior college, go to work on the truck in the morning at 4.30, get off and go, <laughs> go to school. And I, oh, I'll never forget the comment that, that uh, that's a girlfriend of mine said. She said, and I said, why do you like me? You know, she said, 
you're so clean. <laughs> I had to take a shower every day after work. <laughs> I used to work the summers. Uh, I used to go with my father, probably, what, six, seven, eight years old. And I'd never dump any cans. He'd, my job was to take the lids off of the cans. <laughs> then he'd, he'd dump them. What about driving? And then, uh, oh, in Rubicon, we used to go out there. And <laughs> I was t I was ten years old, mm -hmm. okay, ten between ten and twelve, and my father, oh, you drive, you drive the route from one house to the other. So from one house to the other. So, so I didn't have to go in, come out, go in. And it was a stick. I knew how to drive a stick because I I drove all the trucks up here in the yard all the time. So I'd get out, so I'd be driving. The steering wheel would be here to me. <laughs> I could barely see over. <laughs> the customers would come out with garbage, and you know. Where's the driver? <laughs> I called hell. One lady said, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself letting him die. <laughs> <laughs> Could get, never get away with that today, you know. But out there, there was nothing out there. Business was a good place for the children to uh, gain the work ethic and so on. So, and it was a built-in job. You know, dad's always got garbage to do. So, or recycling or something. And, so uh, when the kids got off to high school, that was uh, in Fresno, which was about 25 miles south of us. So oftentimes if I had to pick them up or something, I'd take a packer truck loaded with cardboard or whatever into Fresno and recycle that and then go by and pick the kids up. And most of them got along all right with that. But two of the girls kind of objected. And uh, all of the kids had, had ridden on those side loaders and, and the rear loaders and hauled garbage. The youngest daughter, she just couldn't climb in that garbage truck right across the street from the high school. She had to walk a block down the street. Pick me up down there, Dad. I'll be waiting. Or if I get there early, then she'd walk down there and I'd just follow along beside. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sure garbage, garbage kids, kids of garbage men have experienced some of that along the way. Oh, I did get to drive a, one of them open top trucks with the seven steps to heaven and uh, could pack the garbage can once in a while when one of the drivers were on uh, vacation, but that, is, that was tough duty. I got to give a respect to those uh, individuals before us that uh, put it on their back and carried it up the stairs. I told him I'd go to work if I could start on the trucks and learn that way and he told me I wouldn't last six weeks and I started in November and he was pretty close to right because it was freezing cold and that was the in 1971 we used to go behind houses and pick up cans and we had the big carry cans and it just beat the heck out of you but I was only 29 28 years old at the time so uh, I stuck it out and first couple the first month I thought I was this is nuts. He says, I didn't go to school to do something like this. But uh, after I got the hang of it, it became fun. Mm -hmm. And so I continued. A few guys gave me a hand, told me how to lift those packing cans. and. But I remember my father, who really worked hard. I mean, uh, when you talk about labor, uh, they did it. I mean, they, they didn't have the conveniences today of of sitting in a air conditioned truck and, and listening to uh, you know tape deck music, they actually labored. I mean, walked on hot streets and carried garbage on their back, and they didn't have a cab on the truck. It was just a steel box sitting there that you drove and steps the seven steps to heaven, that sort of thing, uh, with the can on on your back. I mean, it was just hard work, and uh, there was something that I really never had to do. The type of work that we were doing was a lot easier. It was still laborious, but not like they used to do, and I never forgot that. He put me in a route where they pick up the, the slop for the pigs. You know, by the time you do all that and you feed it, then you get ready to go to school. I'd get school at nine o'clock. Jeez, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't just go home, wash, and change your clothes. You had to take a shower, you had to take everything off, because otherwise they could smell you coming two miles away. That would be the late 40s and early 50s. Uh, we, they were all Italians. Uh, they were working on the trucks in El Cerrito even. And uh, 
was just amazing to to see the industriousness of the of the people getting after this uh, this business. It, w it was hard work then. It was a backbreaker, and uh, and it was a job that that showed up and at five o'clock in the morning and and uh, and got the job done. The industry when I was a young man, we used to carry garbage on our shoulders. I mean, up high in a short barrel that the barrel was heavier than, than me. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable how we used to do it. And we'd have contests to see how much a guy could carry, you know? Stupid, stupid. But, uh, you know, and then we went to the, 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 the hook barrel with the shoulder hook. Uh, later on, they have what they call a tub that used to hook on your shoulder. And it held about 50, 60 gallons of garbage, and they were very heavy. And there was a trick to lifting, lifting them swinging them around and get them on your shoulder. At first I had, I used uh, towels. I made a towel pad and used it. And then the tub, you would bang against my, my spine. So I got a big felt pad I used to wear on my spine. Well, as time went on, I got rid of the pads and everything like everybody else. You know, your shoulder would get, your shoulder would get tough and your back would get used to it. And, but it was hard work in those days when everything, everything came out of the backyards. No curbside service. Once in a blue moon, you'd get a good citizen that would put the can out. <laughs> that was really great. We didn't have all the customers on the block like we have now. We have one here, one there, one there. And uh, another thing that was bad, that uh, I had a list of my customers. Well, I maybe had two customers in one block. So I'm going over there early in the morning. I don't know, I'm looking for 15 or 20, whatever, and I can't find it. So I get the flashlight, I, put, I point it at the door to see the number, and here comes the sheriff's department. Because they, you know, they didn't know. So, but, you know, they, they never did nothing to us because hey, we were trying to make a living, you know. Carrying garbage on my back. <laughs> I. Uh, I worked with the uh, gunny sacks and I started out with an open bed truck where you had to climb up the stairs and just dump the garbage in the back. We used to have pans, they had maybe, uh, like say you had a, a 12 unit apartment, they had 12 garbage cans. Mm -hmm. Well the people put, and they had lids, the people put the garbage on top of the, they wouldn't open the lid, put the garbage in the can, they put it on top. And so we ended up, uh, this is the truth, uh, we had to use the uh, uh, burlap sacks and shovels to get the garbage out of these places. That's how bad it was. In our days, it was really uh, time consuming, hard work. Oh, the industry is just night and day difference. You don't pack the can or the sack up those steps. It's a different world out there. They, some of the people working today could never, ever, ever work the way we worked, up those seven steps. And not only what did we go up the steps, but we went down the steps, under tenement houses, up three flights of steps, with a sack on your back, uh, laid the sack down, emptied the can, missed the milk bottles, the salamis and bacalas and laundry, and come on down, get the second house, and then the bottom flight, then carry it all on your back to the truck. Those were hard, hard days. I still have that truck. I restored it, and it's my 1955 truck, and I'll never give that up. I never want to forget where I came from. I laugh, but here I am coming in and we had front loaders, we had compaction. I was in this industry and yet when I came up here they had people putting garbage in gunny sacks and wrapping them and taking them down and putting them into this rear loader. And you know, I was shocked when I saw that, but that's the only thing that would work mm -hmm. under the circumstances of how. And Back then, this hauler would have a key to every home. It was the darn, I, I looked, I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, on my ring with just three or four, I'm looking which one's the key to the front door. These gentlemen actually had, for the whole route, a key to every house and had to go in the back to pick up the trash. And they had aluminum conta containers that they carried on their shoulders. I mean, these things were 60, 70, 80 gallons. There's nobody worked harder than the garbage man packing the can. 
And those cans weighed as much as two, three hundred pounds. I'm not exaggerating, but you guys would lift it on your back in a 50 gallon drum, and walk up the stairs and throw the swill and things and burn ashes or wet ashes and things of that type. But the day of my job, I would get up at 2.30 in the morning because we had a route in the film where we would pull out the garbage. And that would mean by that, before the truck there, the crew would go out because we had a four-man crew and one and, and the driver. So three of us would go out in the morning. And the reason for that, you got all these scattered apartment houses throughout your route. You'd go in there and you'd hump your barrel, tie the garbage up in the cuarta, as they call it, or a blanket. And then you'd throw that in your pickup truck and bring it to a centralized point. So when the driver came with the garbage truck up there, you could bing, bang, boom, throw the stuff in the truck out there and then start your regular, you know, what you call your regular route, you know, the once a week collections and things of that type. The reason you did that is that the routes would be predicated on monetary value that produce X number of dollars a month per revenue. And if you got the right crew together, you could get eight hours, what they construed to be eight hours of normal work, you can get it done in six. And that was your incentive to go home. So you got up at two, sometimes we would make two loads of the, the landfill, the dump as we call it in those days, and we would be able to get that completed. And we would go home, and that was it. And the, but at night you had to go out and ring the doorbells, collect the garbage. When I first started working, I was 16 in San, in San Francisco. I was big for my age, played football, and uh, always in good shape, you know, and I even loved it then, and I still do. You know, we walk, walked up those seven steps with a big load on your back, it was the seven steps up into heaven. Heaven was on your load of that sack, and we carried sacks with all the goo dripping down your back up three flights of stairs, down under the tenement houses, and came up here, it was a different world. Everybody had a garbage disposal. Clean garbage, no wet, sloppy stuff. It was, uh, it was a different environment. I remember this awful day, and this sort of exemplified the entire story. And I was walking down on, on Fillmore and McAllister at 10 o'clock in the morning. It was definitely hot and humid. And he had to go down this alleyway, and this exemplifies a lot of the garbage collections in the city and you'd have to walk by these meters and the barrel wouldn't fit between the gas meter and, and the wall. So you have to drop the barrel, bring it down, and then you'd walk around this corner and down a little flight of stairs and there's a, uh, there was a uh, produce store there. And there's flies flying all around like crazy. And you whack, there's a backed up sewer and you got these high boots on. You walk through that and you go upstairs into this blackness of night and there is, you can hear cats or rats. You don't know what's up in front of you. So you put the barrel by instinct or tradition, you would put the barrel in front of you. If it's a cat, it would jump in your face and a cat either go around you. If rats, they would run down the alleyway out there. So at this particular instant, I go up there with the barrel in front, it's a cat, it goes down the street. So I get to the top floor and you're in total darkness. And this is at 10 o'clock in the morning. You dump the barrel and first barrel because what's the worst garbage is always on the bottom of the barrel. And you get to the bottom of the barrel and you can smell there's something bad in there, like dead meat or something. The second thing, you jump on that and you get on top of the barrel to jump it down so you get it all, you don't have to go back and do it again. So you pull it off the stair, throw it in your shoulder, down the stairs you'd go, pass through this, this, uh, this fly infested area and you inhale a fly. I mean, this is really bad. And as you're gagging and everything else like that, so you walk through this alley and then here's those two gas meters sitting there looking at you in the distance and you're proud to yourself, do you get up there and, 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 and uh, uh, drop the barrel pick the damn thing up again, or you get down to your knees and crawl underneath the meters. So in doing so, there's little three or four stairs in front of you, and you climb up the stairs, and just about that, something, something hot sits you in the back of the neck. And it's maggots. You can hear the goddamn things, all right? So you walk up the stairs, you walk up the seven stairs of heaven, you throw the barrel in the truck, and you're wiping these, these maggots off your neck, and the coffin of this fly, and there's some dude sitting there drinking wine in the glass staring at you. And he's looked at me and he says, man, he says, what are you looking at? And because I was tough in those days. I'd fight as a drop of a hat. He said, you're looking at something. And, and he said, nothing, man, nothing, man. I said, what are you looking at? Is something funny? He said, nothing. I just thought Lincoln freed the slaves. <laughs> That's a God's honest truth. <laughs> and many people in the garbage company wouldn't work in the Fillmore because of that. But you could get through your routes early and go home. And after a while, you got sort of used to it. You the gloves, you put rubber bands around your shoes so the rats wouldn't run up your legs and go into the route there. It was an awful place to pick up garbage. And we, yet we did it. We didn't think anything about it. It was just a day's work. You got up in the morning, rain, shine, you went out to work in the damn garbage. And uh, you just got sort of accustomed to it. And I know working on the garbage, in the garbage industry, getting up before 30 in the morning, sometimes earlier than that, and going out in that cold every day, in the rain, whatever, 
you know, I know what a newspaper man from kid feels like. <laughs> oh, I used to sit. I used to be in open trucks, you know, and you sit in that truck and you just put on your wetsuit or whatever you had, you know, slicker, and it's raining like heck, and sure the windshield wipers are gone, but he has to look over the windshield to see. Oh God, was that miserable? And then to have that first cup of coffee and and a snail or a donut. Oh God. In the morning, you'd stop at the first, you, the first pickup would be a restaurant. <laughs> that was our first stop. i never forget, you know, when I was working the garbage truck, <clears throat> before I became president in Richmond, we had a bar there in El Cerrito, I mean, San Pablo Avenue in Richmond called the Alvarado uh, Gardens Bar. we get there about four in the morning, as bartender, never forget. There was three of us in the truck in those days. And we get there in the morning, and uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays, our first stop, <laughs> we'd get there, pick up the garbage, says, come on and have a drink. So he'd, he'd pour us a couple of shot glasses of whiskey. Uh, and then it also changed from, when I started, we used to carry the stuff on our back. Now they got automated trucks. We used to get back aches, now they get corporal tunnel uh, on their hands. <laughs> and then now, the industry, as far as the mechanics of it, now the guy picks up my place. <laughs> Then he can get out of the truck. <laughs> he might get out to pick up a piece of paper, <laughs> so there's still some of the problems, you know. But uh, I mean, it's it, it's tremendous in terms of uh, uh, people, uh, not only safety, but uh, can you imagine what it, you know? Every ache and pain I have is probably from carrying garbage, you know. My, my shoulders, I've had operations for rotator cuff, you name it, mainly because we kind of wore ourselves out in those days. A lot of us that worked for Sunset and Golden Gate, for example, we were into recycling in the 20s. We were doing very thorough recycling. If uh, uh, someday somebody will describe how how tough and detailed that was. Today, it's a badge of honor, and I'm sure any person in the industry, as long as we have, can relate to the fact that. The way they work today, how easy it is by comparison. Although they still work hard, it was nothing like we. We were short of slave labor. The only thing that changed in the front of the truck, they took the horse away and put an engine in front of it. But in those days, uh, uh, the trash man didn't have much to pick up other than a, a half a barrel or a quarter barrel of ashes that was dumped once a month. And uh, people used to, uh, in the countryside, why they had a chicken uh, that uh, and a pig or something that uh, probably took care of the scraps and things that they had. Major part of the uh, business in those days was not only did they pick up garbage, but they raised pigs. And uh, now the pigs were being uh, fed from restaurant waste. They they didn't feed into the garbage dump itself, but. Uh, that was a major income uh, for the family at that particular time, or for my family at least. The term in Italian, romante, romante, which means scavenger. And that's why so many of the companies were called Sunset Scavenger, Oakland Scavenger, Alameda Scavenger. It was that all their grandfathers collected swill to feed hogs. I mean, recycling then had to be because that was the only way you could make money. <laughs> we were called scavengers in the old days. Uh, uh, my first job was at uh, uh, West Coast Salvage, or actually with G.B. Torres and Son, which was the recycling arm of Golden Gate Disposal in those days. My first uh, boss, when I worked there as a kid, was Benny Anselmo Sr. And that plant was basically state-of-the-art. Uh, we did things that the, we should be doing today. See, I was never a garbage man. I was a scavenger. I came from a company called Scavengers Protective Association, which is now Golden Gate and then changed to NorCal. And we scavenged through the waste. We made as much money scavenging as we did from the rate period of 25 cents a month back in the late 40s and 50s. So, you know, we sold rags, we sold bottles, and we sold them back to the wineries up in Napa, the fifth half gallon, gallon, and champagne bottles. They used to be a standard wine bottle for all wineries. There used to be a standard Santa Clara Purex Clorox bottle. There used to be a standard beer bottle, a champagne bottle, all standard sizes. And the consequence was well, you bring them back and we would put, uh, rewash those bottles, put them in cases with the corks and send them back to the things out there. 
The reason they did that, they claimed, they told us that was the only place we were making money. We were losing the garbage business. The thing of it was is that cost of recovering that material was zero because you were getting paid to collect the garbage and you had to separate that stuff. And that mentality, not that it was good or bad, I don't even know to this day, but the bottom line was that was the profit that the companies made by scavenging. And that's where they buy it. And whatever they sold out there was almost 100% profit because they didn't, there's hardly any expense associated with collecting it. We used to be scavengers. You know, I remember the days that I used to stand in the truck and they'd throw this stuff in and I'd tear every, even a shoebox, I'd tear it and put it that corner, bones over there, you know, you were scavengers. As far as recycling, my dad was recycling back when he started. They used to save rags, cardboard, paper, uh, appliances, wood. Uh, matter of fact, there's a house in Mill Valley that was built strictly from lumber found in the dump. And uh, it's still standing, by the way, <laughs> so after all these years. You know, recycling is old and for the garbage industry. Everybody was doing it back then, but nobody ever talked about it. And it, until it got popular, all of a sudden it got out in the public. In the early days, they used to, uh, in the open trucks, you used to uh, get in and you'd stand in the garbage and you used to collect, pick up the papers and the bottles and the cans and stuff like that. In fact, my father had the reputation, they said, that uh, he would even pick up the postage stamps. I mean, he was one, if not one of the best garbage men ever lived. You talk about recycling, they recycled everything in those days. Bones, uh, bottles and rags and and uh, they had these in barrel they had uh, I mean in a truck you know they had two barrels in there to put the rags and then the metals in the other barrel and then uh, when the barrels were full they stopped the truck you know and uh, open the back doors they had a burlap sack they opened a burlap sack and then the guy get the barrel and dumped all the the rags in this burlap sack see Oh, we used to save rags, we used to save bottles. We used to make all our own burlaps. The wife, we used to rip the sacks, she sewed the burlaps. We did that for a long time. And when we gave up the burlaps, oh, that was a celebration. Okay, first of all, every truck, they were open boxes. And we kept the men inside to, to recycle, to, to scavenge out of it, okay? And then you put the different recyclable in, in different, uh, blankets and whatever, and then we brought it to a, a plant and, and we dump it into, into a table twice as long as this and we pick through it, okay? And, and we put bottles on one side and so on and so forth, rags and whatever. And, and then the buildings downtown, we used to, everything was inside. Now everything is outside, now in those days everything was inside. Uh, we would go inside the building and separate the paper from the garbage because the people threw everything on the floor. In those, they, they, they didn't care. And then we would separate the paper from the garbage, tie it in blankets, and, and then we took it out and, and put it on the sidewalk. And then we had special, special trucks, flatbed trucks. They would pick it up, put it on the trucks, and they would recycle it and bring it to the factory and so on and so forth. So that's the way we, we recycled. And we had a, a man that used to go at the dump once a week where we dumped the garbage. And when you dump it, if you find two pieces of paper like this, $5 fine. In those days, in suspension, they give you a fine. Sometimes the president would be at the dump and you'd open up the gate and find a bottle in there, you could have a $5 fine for not recycling. I was the youngest board member and the board of director of the company in San Francisco. I was only 23, just got out of the service. And uh, the board of directors runs the company even though you work on a truck, but you still got the power. And once in a while, one of the guys on the board of the right to go to the dump. And he watches the truck when they dump. If, if he hears a lot of bottle come down or he see a lot of newspaper come down, he, he, he goes over there and sometimes we gave him a five, five dollar fine, you know. I'm in the dump watch, watching the truck and here comes my father. Now what am I gonna do to my father? And he looks at me and he goes like this. <laughs> and I may believe I wrote something. <laughs> but, but. And then recycling died. First of all, so we used to sell all the bottles to the, to the wineries. Well, they started, the whiskey, we used to sell the glass. And then the beers, 
they, they, they were all recycled, what do you say, returnable. Now, all of, all of a sudden, everything became one way. Uh, rags, they, 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 they were not cutting anymore, so you can use it as wiping rags, because we used to cut them and sell them as wiping rags for the mechanics and people like that. So that, that vanished, the, the bottle business vanished, uh, washing bottles wasn't uh, healthy anymore, uh, and they were right because some of the stuff that, that, that was in it. And, and so the recycling business died. The paper business also almost died, except for the corrugated. And the newspaper a little bit. But the waste paper business, there was very little. As time went by, the, the, this is a highly labor oriented business. Benny Anselmo came up with this wonderful idea. And he had this concept. He said that every time you get in a truck, you grind the transmission, to, you put the clutch in, bang, your transmissions fall out. You should be using Allison transmissions, which the Golden Gate didn't at the time out there. You should be using diesel engines because that's the way to go on. And he said, just remember this. And like Richie said, the Interesso, he says, you got four men to a crew. And there's four people when the garbage truck gets on the street out of there is producing revenue by going out and collecting the garbage and bringing it to the truck. He says, once the front of the truck fills up and the secondary job to sort the bags and the rags, the bottles, the sacks out there, that fourth man becomes non-productive. And therefore, there's only really three men bringing revenue to the truck at that time. But because he's in the truck, just bring your barrel back, the Italian power to jump on it, pull the sideboards and build the fences up in the front and all the other kind of stuff associated with it, he doesn't produce anything as far as is concerned. You eliminate that man recycling inside the truck, you will pay for a brand new Packer truck. Now, what logical sense is it? When I became president, I had 104 four-man trucks picking up garbage. We got through, we had 68 three-man trucks, 12, 14 front-end loaders and roll-off units picking up the St. Wayne Street. But you lost access to the so-called stuff. We stayed in the cardboard business, in the newsprint business, and we played in, but not the, the rags, the bottles, the sacks. That was out the window. You know, and, and I think back about it when, in my early years, we were recycling, and it wasn't AB 939. I mean, we were doing cardboard and newspaper and uh, a certain amount of high-grade papers, uh, some glass and whatnot. And then as wages increased and our industry became more mechanized, we went away from it. Pretty soon we were taking everything in the truck and putting it all in the landfill. And then as, as time went on, when I say that, we still bailed cardboard and, and newspaper, but we didn't really sort it like we used to. The big move came in, you know, the late 50s, early 60s uh, with the, the invention of the compaction truck. And that allowed them to stay out on the route a little bit longer. Uh, they dispensed with the recycling because it was becoming more and more uh, labor intensive. And compaction allowed them to, you know, compact more on the truck, spend more time on the route take it to the landfill or to the dump at that time and, and you know, dump it and get back to the route so they didn't have to spend so much time driving back and forth. And that really eliminated the, the concept of, of recycling. And then in the 70s, there was, the, you know, the big movement of Earth Day and uh, a whole new awareness and consciousness of the, of the environment. And as a result, we kind of evolved back into separating everything at the curb and suddenly we found ourselves back into this sorting uh, process. Biggest thing I've seen is um, the emphasis on recycling and diversion. As I said earlier, when I came into it, we had one truck and everything went into that truck. We had a little rack on the side where we store newspaper, but everything else went into the back of the truck. And as time progressed, just more and more things have been taken out of the waste stream and you have to handle them um, in a different way. They don't go to landfill anymore. You know, they go to different, um, different destinations. I remember the days when people used to recycle glass. They'd go to a, a glass company and dump glass, green, yellow, white, whatever. And then the garbage men would come and pick up that glass and dump it in the dumps. So recycling was not true recycling. It was a PR thing because the public demanded it. So that somebody, you know, the glass companies had to give it to them. You know, in other words, recycling was really not put up to what it is today. Today now they're reusing, they're, mm -hmm. you're, it's, it's the ethic was always good. You know, and I never was against it. It's just that it wasn't practical then. 
And what we tried to do is keep the bottom, keep the rate down as low as we could for the garbage service. Recycling was not as, as attractive then. It was really a money, money loser, bad. And the markets just went to hell, excuse me, but they just, they disappeared in the 50s. Um, and you couldn't give this stuff away. So it fell on its face. And a lot of people had a lot invested in it. A lot of our industry brothers had a lot invested in it. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't fashionable anymore until the 70s. So it was difficult to restart that with the, the, the history that a lot, of the, a lot of the industry members had, especially the old timers. I'm an old timer now, okay? But um, at that time, they'd, they'd kind of been burned uh, and reluctant to start again. But they did go along with it, and, and uh, fortunately they did support it. And they had to prove it to them that it was going to be there. And it was a struggle because we didn't have markets in the, for the first years in the 70s. It was, uh, we had mountains of paper. We had glass that we couldn't get rid of. It's improved vastly. The garbage men were called scavengers. Or, you know, I mean, that's what they were, okay? And they did. They, they scavenged anything and everything that was worth of value. That's where they made a lot of their money. So then, somewhat came up with the, you know, with the spin of recycling and so on and so forth. And um, uh, uh, the the garbage companies were really kind of against that. They they kind of felt that as a threat. I think the only one that took the position that, well, if the communities want to do it and they're willing to pay to do it, let's do it. And that was uh, Joe Garbarino. We were always scavengers, and scavenging for me was now called recycling. That's where it really got me started. I, I knew we could do something more than we were doing rather than bury it all. It took a little bit of effort, but you could do it if you wanted to. There was an opportunity to go to Sacramento and get a grant to start a recycling program. So I had these big dreams of starting the first curbside recycling program countywide in the United States. And I went up to Sacramento and they shot me down. Said, no, no, you don't qualify. So I was really down in the dumps, literally. Came back and explained it to some of our environmentalists. Says, Joe, that's the way things work up there in Sacramento. We're gonna go back tomorrow. I said, you're kidding me, no. We're gonna go up with a van load of environmentalists and we're gonna talk to them. Well, they talked to them for three hours and they gave up. I says, hey, you guys win. And we had a commitment for 1980 of a half a million dollars. And that did start the first curbside recycling program countywide in the United States. We did a demonstration project for the Waste Board on curbside recycling. Uh, developed a container, little boxes, we call it Recycle 3 because there were three different boxes. Um, when we eventually sold to Waste Management in 1986, they adopted that as Recycle America. We put together our own recycling. We did a total recycling, went into every phase that we could. And we did it on a, not on an expensive base, we didn't have the money to do it. But having some pretty good people work for me that had, were geniuses in putting together machinery. Because we built our own recycling equipment, conveyors and storage units and, and all that kind of stuff. We've seen that era change. Uh, as a young kid I saw it and I see it today as, as we talk about uh, the recycling that we're doing here and now and all, it was done back then. It isn't, we haven't invented the wheel, we just have more of it. It's progressed over the years where we started. First it went into where we went to the curbside recycling and then a yard waste program um, to coincide. And in, in 87, which was a big change for us, we uh, went fully uh, semi-automated with carts. So everything at that point had to be bag bundled or tied on the curb and in the can, um, where before we were running tractors even to pick up the yard waste and, and stuff off the street. And all that material was going to the landfill, where now all that material goes to our station and we, uh, we uh, grind, clean it up, and then we sort it and it gets made into compost. And the same way with the recycling, everything gets sorted out and bailed up, shipped to a, another market. So none of that material goes into the landfill. I think recycling was a big motivator. as never owning a landfill and uh, embracing recycling, which is something my father and grandfather did was part of the business of scavenging or trying to make extra money from whatever they could sell off of 
and not what they charge the rate payers. So the recycling has been a big, big challenge, big change. We embraced it. And by doing that, I think uh, we've made a niche for ourselves. Uh, if it wasn't for recycling, we'd probably be out of business. And the big guys bought up all the landfills and transfer stations, and we wouldn't have been able to compete. It, during the late 80s, 90s, we, when we started truly curbside recycling and yard waste recycling, collection was just the first part, part of your day. You collected it, then you had to process your, your material, uh, either sort it, send it off to market, composting, you know, which is a three to six month process. Now all of a sudden that's a whole nother job. We're composting material, getting it ready to sell the market, and then it truly having to go out and market material. So the, the industry's changed hugely from just being collection, taking it to a landfill, dump, dumping it, and driving home. Now all of a sudden you bring it back to your facility, and now you have to have a whole nother taking care of it and uh, seeing it go to, go to market, which again now is the biggest part of our job. You know, and again, recycling just keeps growing. Uh, there's more and more mandates, more and more uh, avenues to sell product, market product, uh, and that's will continue to be the, the growth of the industry. Why garbage keeps getting smaller and smaller. And percentage of the the waste stream, you, you know, recycling keeps growing. So, but it's it's funny because then the industry kind of changed. I mean, we still did do cardboard and stuff, but nothing like we do today with you know three different containers mm -hmm. for every house, making three trips to a house. You know, mm -hmm. and and I th quite honestly, I think the industry has changed for the better. I mean, we're we're doing the right thing. You know, there was limited landfill space available, and by moving on through AB 939 into all the recycling and everything. Uh, it's enabled, you know, it's just a better way of life, I think, for everybody and for my kids and my grandkids and everything else. And all we're trying to do is keep a legacy for our children, keep the earth, you know, sustainable as opposed to destroying it just by burying everything. But people need to step up and be responsible. Well, we came, came a long ways in the garbage business. And there, oh, I should say refuse. Business. I've watched the industry evolve. You know, I've watched it change. You know, I, I tend to say a lot that the golden age of garbage is over, you know, because it seemed like it was a lot simpler business at one time where people didn't worry about it as much. They just wanted you to get their garbage. Now everybody, you know, understands it. Recycling has become a big issue. It's it's a little bit more in the, uh, you know, the crosshairs of the public. You know, they see what you're doing. But um, it's it's been an exciting industry. It's it's been a challenge at times, but you know, a lot of those challenges have turned into opportunities for us. When I first my father first went over in Richmond, our common practice was is open burning. I mean, you used to, at the end of the day, you used to pour some gasoline on the garbage and set it on fire. Uh, you can just imagine what the smog conditions in the Bay Area would be if that practice had to continue. In 1957, when the burn, burning went off, we, we used to have a landfill up off of Giant Road and, and burned uh, uh, the garbage. When the burn went off in 57 for the air pollution controls uh, regulations, uh, the dump fee beginning at Richmond Sanitary, the landfill was $985 a month, all-inclusive. From there to over a million dollars a year. I got out in 86, I think, and at that point our dump fee was about eight or nine dollars a ton. Today, this year, we're paying 110, and that was, uh, that was a big change. We were still burning the landfill that I was hauling to was a burning dump, uh, so that wasn't long before that was outlawed, and uh, and then the red tape began to develop. Uh, the protection of the environment, the water quality people, everybody was having a fit about the way it was being handled, and so uh, it's become you know much more sophisticated, much more technical, uh, and of course it's created a lot of jobs that way. Now, as far as San Francisco, the changes came 
uh, just before and right after I retired because they changed the method of collecting garbage. They went from real orders to silo orders to semi-automated system. They started that fantastic tree, which they give the, the people three garbage cans, one for green waste, one for garbage, and one for recycling. That was a big change. Now in San Francisco, you probably know that San Francisco is big on food waste. And I started that program in a small way uh, just before I retired. That food waste is the hit, and I think it's only a matter of time until everybody is going to go into it. Because if they want to reduce the, the amount of garbage that goes to a landfill, especially in cities like San Francisco where, there's a lot of, where there, there are a lot of restaurants. But you know, every city has restaurants, you know, and, uh, and the food waste is so easy to collect. Okay, and then make compost out of it. And what it was is trying to get the material from the back of the house on the curb. That was the biggest first change that people had. And then trying to get it from the curb uh, into containerization. I went to the city for a rate increase and I gave them a choice between going behind the house or putting everything to the curb. And we kept telling everybody, you know, all of our complaints come from leaving gates open, letting dogs out. We start at 4 o'clock in the morning, and so we're in somebody's backyard at 5 o'clock. It's a wonder we, some of us didn't get shot, you know, because you're sound asleep, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you hear this crashing of a garbage can being unloaded into this. Mm -hmm. So when we went to the city, we convinced the city to make it mandatory for everybody to put their garbage to the curb. Once that happened, we could get rid of the packing cans, mm -hmm. except for some of the old guys that just lived with that thing on their shoulder. They'd still go from house to house picking it up. But that was our biggest change, mm -hmm. and that was in probably 75. And then the next biggest change came in 77 when we went to the uh, semi-automated rubber container, the plastic containers. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then you could see the change coming about by the personnel because you weren't beat up. Then we could get, then we got, you know, truck drivers who hauled garbage instead of garbage men who also drove a truck. <laughs> we had a big, big difference. Big difference. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the trucks got better. The times we're telling you about now is like the heyday of the refuse business. It was from really pretty junky packing cans leaking. The trucks used to leak oil so horribly and all that to there was an about a 15-year growth there in there yeah, between the Detroit's. Yeah, Detroit, Detroit diesels. Engines. The engines leaked, but the hydraulics were horrible yeah. and slow and noisy and bang. All that stuff grew. 25 years ago, everybody was rear loader, backyard service, things like that. I guess it's become uh, uh, a lot higher tech. You know, I can remember coming in here and. Most of the routes had to deal with uh, the route driver, knew the routes, and, and the way he collected it was in his own head and maybe his helper's head. Uh, we did have a list of streets that were collected on certain days, and we had a System 36 computer when I came in here, which had 15 megabytes of memory. And we could build one section of the city and then had to clean the memory out and have to reload it with the new memory. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, we started having to do things like recycling, which this company always did recycle, but we had to do more, and all of a sudden the technology just went boom. Now these trucks are one-man trucks. They have turn-by-turn -turn routes that Ron Fernese's identified and, and drawn and made. Turn-by-turn, uh, -turn, start here, finish there. On GPS, we know pounds per house, uh, collection seconds, all of this stuff, all because of a computer that just gives you uh, the ability to track a lot of information where, you know, like I said, 25 years ago, you became a helper on the truck uh, in order to learn the route, and you stayed on that truck so you could learn that one route. Put in new software and brought, brought online, you know, sort of some new technologies and new modern way of doing business back that, at that time. Um, I can remember you know, we first got that big computer. It was the size of this table, and you know, right now my my uh, my telephone I think has more has more uh, storage capacity in it than the, than that computer did. But it was a big step for us. Um, you know, we also brought into you know we, we brought into line um, you know new ways of collection. Uh, we improved our our 
our commercial collection switching over to front loaders instead of rear loaders. Um, we went from automated to semi-automated to fully automated trucks and it just realized you know uh, a lot of the changes you know up to today we're you know now we have all our trucks GPS and um, are online doing the our online um, doing real-time sort of data collection around our truck so it's been an exciting ride. Before being in this business I was Pleasanton Garbage Services corporate banker so I did all their financing and prior to 92 all the financing really required was buying trucks and then starting in 1990 with uh, the introduction of AB 939 it required companies to provide additional services so that required additional types of financing. Uh, once I got into this business in 92 and going forward probably over about the last five years or so there's been other types of financing available than traditional bank financing primarily uh, pollution control financing through the state of California uh, bond financing and so that's required some sort of creative methods in which to finance these these large facilities that are now required to meet the AB 939 goals. So that seems to be evolving and continuing to change, which is a far cry from buying just trucks. What they were confronting in the early 80s, I maintain, is very, very little resemblance to what they're confronting now. The level of sophistication required of the haulers today uh, is vastly different. I imagine there were many haulers in the early 80s that operated without much of assistance at all from attorneys, probably very little assistance from accountants. Uh, their consulting fees now are probably a significant line item in everybody's budget because they, they can't be experts in everything and they need experts in almost everything they do because of the level of scrutiny and regulation that they're subject to. The industry, the way I see it changed, when we were, uh, when I first started, uh, is all you would go to the city, they'd give you a long-term contract. If they liked who they were dealing with, you got a long-term contract. Nowadays, they give you a seven to ten year contract, and it's you know pretty hard to even get your money back for the equipment you buy. So we went in, had to build a transfer station, so we had to get an extension or a franchise. Uh, and they give us a 20-year contract, and that doesn't happen nowadays. Years ago, we We'd go down to City Hall and sit down and talk and a handshake and it was all done and you went and you, you worked your hardest and uh, for the community and, uh, and they realized that and they gave us long-term contracts. But I, I don't see that in the future unless things change. It's just more of a capital intense business from going from labor intense to capital intense. It wasn't until you know, the company started making true investment in capital of equipment mm -hmm. that I think we finally got through our minds is, hey, we need to charge the right rate and make money and pay back this investment we have in our time and mm -hmm. capital uh, that truly started making people pay for the serv services they re received. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting a return for the work we do, the investment we, we have compared to uh, back then, you know, it was a, a, you know, a horse, a wagon, and it was all labor. Uh, you know, now lab labor is a part of it, but it's a lot of capital, a lot of liability, uh, and, it, you know, we get a return for, for that. Maybe I see the changes even more dramatically because I was out of the industry for seven years. I mean, when I went on the waste board, um, I had a pretty good idea. I saw where, where NorCal was going and uh, was part of that. And then when I went to Cal Sierra, it was back, you know, we, we were a little more back, back to basics. And leaving Cal Sierra and going to the waste board, there were a lot of changes happened over the last eight or nine years. Um, trucks became more sophisticated. Payloads became uh, the opportunity to increase payloads were there. Um, productivity was viewed differently than it was when I was on a truck or um, back in the 80s or 90s. You know, we used to put together what we felt was a good day's work and tell people to go out and, and do it. And then they would come in and if they came in in five hours or six hours, they still got paid for eight. And that had to change. It, it's kind of gone full circle in that 
Um, we now have more trucks on the road. Um, we're handling more products than than we than we ever did. You know, when we used to do it in the back of the truck. So, it's been a big circle. Uh, you know, circling around, and um, now we've got the inception of you know universal waste, which is you know creating another truck that's got to go out on the on the route to to collect lampshade lamps and you know CRTs and and things that were going into the waste stream now we have to keep them separate. The C&D ordinances that everybody is passing uh, for the diversion requirements uh, are probably the biggest change we've seen and uh, the biggest actually boost to business that we've had in, in the last couple of years. And so here we are and how it's come to this now and boy automation and one man in a vehicle and it's um, to be a part of it it's been wonderful. We had some women drivers that we put out. I used to have some real heated discussions with uh, Patty's dad, with Joe, about you know, women drivers in the garbage bin. What are you doing? We wound up doing the same thing, and then some. Uh, Charlie Catania from San Luis, we used to have some heated de debates about recycling in general, but finally it all came into the same fold. It was always thought of, or predominantly thought of, that it just went to the son and the oldest. show you how antiquated it was. Uh, Dr. Barbieri, who was her father, was the founder of the company. Uh, because she couldn't work the trucks, uh, she made less than the other partners, which is would be unheard of in today, you know, in today's environment and that. But that was the mentality. Yeah, it's still a service business. Yeah. It's still taking care of the customer. I mean, I, I see for me the biggest change, although technology has um, has influenced the industry. You know, I think the regulatory is, is, um, has influenced it the most. You know, what can you and can't you throw away and still protect the environment and how do you throw it away? I mean, I think that's where we've seen the biggest changes for us and it's, you know, it seems to be coming at you just faster and faster, you know. It's so much more political. I mean, you know, I spend the vast majority of my time working with my cities and my counties and um, you know, work in the political side of it. Um, I've almost had to become a politician. And, you know, there are days where I miss just going out on a garbage truck, finishing my route and going home. It's, you know, with the legislature and the changes that have come, you know, of course, you know, 939 being the big one, but, um, you know, there's always something on the horizon, always something changing. My saying always is, it's like we started from the, the caveman era and we're into the space shuttle era. My father used to tell me that, that um, when they used to have horse drawn wagons back in the, you know, in the twenties, you know, um, they used to get the horses from the, uh, the fire department and they were usually older retired horses. And, you know, the trick when you had a wagon is that the, the horse would just, walk right along through the route. The, the horse knew the route, you know, as good as the guys on the, on the back of the truck. And that worked out really well until there was a fire. And, the, you know, the fire, you know, the, the horse wagons took off and the sirens took off and so did your horse that was pulling the, pulling the cart, pulling the garbage off. But that was a, that was a very uh, important part, I think, of the industry was what happened in San Francisco and how a lot of the Italian immigrants really got their start by, um, you know, just on a horse-drawn cart, walking through the city, doing their routes, and how they organized themselves. We went from open tops to packers, which was a big improvement. These older guys all had open top trucks, where you walk up right through the cab and dump over the back of the truck into a big 16-yard open truck, then get in and stomp on it so you could go further. And uh, my dad used to tell me, you know, gee, things are really starting to move. And they acquired their first uh, packer, which was a Garwood. And uh, I think it was an 18-yarder. And that was hydraulics. You know, we could just throw the stuff in the back, and it was just a wonderful way to work. I've seen it go from the, from the, the walk up, the open trucks, to the packers, to the recycling, and, and all of those things involved. Uh, you know, we've... we've just like when I started, I we had had the old trucks that uh, had the stairs, and you you had the open cut off cabs, and and uh, walked up the stairs and carried pack the pack out tubs and cans, and uh, 
uh, carried the garbage, you know, from backyard uh, to the truck. We're through the era of going to re rear loader trucks and now to the fully automated trucks and roll out carts and everything's either pretty much uh, curbside or, or alley pickup. And when I was very young, I occasionally worked on an open truck. And so you had the open trucks moving to more of the mechanized compaction type of trucks. And, and then where we are right now is the automated trucks. So the ease of working on a truck has made a significant impact. It changed plenty. With the, it, it changed, especially on a truck, the, the different kind of truck. I remember the first time that they came up with the demonstrator, they, they, the, the Garwood truck that, that had the blade that go, went around and pushed the garbage in. Well, the guy showed us all the nice things about the truck. But then, at the end, I said, but this truck has to be running all day in order for the stuff to... And I said, we can't afford the gas. And so <laughs> I voted against it the first time. During the war years, you couldn't buy any, any equipment, and everything they bought was... Uh, they'd buy like an axle in Reno and a, and a radiator in Oakland. That's how they, 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 they uh, built the trucks. In 1947, we bought three new trucks, international, brand new. Mechanicking was another thing at uh, getting started in the garbage business. You're buying used equipment and just because of the monetary situation. And uh, so you become a pretty much of an expert at that truck or those trucks that you've got. You know what, you know how to get them repaired. You don't even have backup equipment because you can't afford that either. Oh, the first, first little Packer truck we had uh, got from a company in Atascadero that was a push-out rig and didn't have any teardrop in the back that you loaded into and then wiped the garbage up inside. You literally, at that time, were 55-gallon barrels. You'd come up to a door that was chest high on the side of the truck because it was higher than the rails plus about 12 inches, so you had a little bit of a uh, lip there to keep trash from falling out. And then you pitched that 55-gallon barrel up in there and shook it out. And sometimes you had to climb up in there to get it, but... Uh, that was affectionately known as the marshmallow. It was white and kind of looked like a marshmallow from the side. Not much, it was a cab over, a little GMC cab over. Nicknamed the marshmallow was our, our first truck. We drove that truck for a long, long time. Become attached to it too. Most all tipper technology was made in Reno, Nevada. Not by us, but through with us, through us, but there was another company that developed all these high lift and fold away tippers and all this stuff everybody's using nowadays. Yeah, the first time we put a tipper on, a guy go over and uh, a dump would rip the tipper off. Yeah. You know, so we had to learn, you know, you learn trial and error on a lot of things like that. We had a forklift, and this forklift had a rotary head that would turn, and that's how we picked up commercial waste in wooden containers that would pick up by a forklift, open truck, and then dumping the stuff. And that's way before the uh, interventions coming in of, of uh, front loaders. And we had bought our first front loader from Vince Spoles. And he had done that, I think it was like 1961. And it was a CO 190, a gas engine, and they had auxiliary engines. And the transmission then was a Selectomatic. No one can remember that. but. Um, this industry uh, has tried everything mm -hmm. and by having an auxiliary engine that ran the hydraulics mm -hmm. so we were able even back then to have off-road tax use because it was diesel running that and propane running the truck and that's how that started about being able to get a rebate on just how much fuel was used in our industry off-road. Uh, there's so much to learn about the technology side of the business, you know, the trucks and everything from there, people take, I think, take a lot of it for granted, where they just think it's just a truck going down the street, you know, and the guys pick up the garbage recycling and all that, but there's a lot more to it.